This is Judge Martin Hoffman in the 68th District Court. Uh, we're here on cause number DC178139, Michael Grimm versus the city of Denton, uh, Texas. Uh, this is, we have two hearings set for day, today, uh, a motion for judgment on a jury verdict and a motion uh, to, uh, for JNOV, a judgment notwithstanding, notwithstanding the verdict. Uh, this is as a result of a jury trial that occurred a little over a month ago with a sizable verdict. Um, if the counsel could go ahead and make their appearances, uh, so for some reason, Mr. Roberson walked away. I'm not sure why. So Ms. Ashmore, why don't you make your appearance? This is Allison Ashmore with Dykema on behalf of Defendant City of Denton. Uh, Robert Goodman and Eric Roberson. For plaintiff. For plaintiff. Yes, Mr. Craddaville. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Chris Craddaville from the Dyke Law Firm on behalf of the defendant, the City of Denton, Texas. Okay, we have two uh, motions today. I think we decided when we were off the record that the JNOV uh, motion by the defendants would go first. Uh, if you want to go ahead and take that, Ms. Ashmore. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Um, there's been substantial briefing on defendant's motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Um, and given that we have limited time with you this morning and we wanna be respectful of the court's time and appreciative that we are having, having this by Zoom this morning, there are really two points of the several in, in defendant's motion that I wanna focus the court's attention on this morning. The first is that uh, the argument that there is not factually or legally sufficient evidence that plaintiffs reported in good faith a violation of law by the employing governmental entity uh, or another public employee. There's, there's no dispute that the reported violation of law was not by another public employee. I believe plaintiffs agree with that. Their argument is that uh, council member Briggs is essentially the employing governmental entity and that the alleged violation of law was therefore by the city of Denton uh, through council member Briggs's actions. Uh, the violation of law by statute must be by the employing governmental entity um, in order to meet the, the statutory requirements. Now here, council member Briggs was not the employing governmental entity. There are two main cases that both parties are relying on uh, for, their, for their position. And, and defendant would submit that both City of Cockrell Hill uh, versus Johnson and Housing Authority of City of El Paso versus Wrangell, both of those cases support defendant's position. Uh, City of Cockrell Hill versus Johnson found that the act, the Texas Whistleblower Act, is applicable in cases involving legal violations committed by an official in the scope of the official's duties. In that case, an alderman had violated the law and was charged with a criminal violation of assault. And the council, which the aldermen were all a part of, terminated the plaintiffs following that, that charge. And, and in, in that situation, the council had the authority to terminate plaintiffs, which is, which is very different from ours where council cannot, council members can't in, involve themselves in employment situations. But, um, the Court of Appeals in Cockrell Hill held that the alderman was not the equivalent of the employing governmental entity because he was not acting in his official capacity as an alderman when allegedly violating the law. Now, Housing Authority of El Paso versus Wrangell um, also said that an employee's actions taken pursuant to his duties and authorized by state law are considered actions taken by the state or, or by the employing entity. Conversely, acts that are outside the scope of an employee's official duties are not acts of the state. And there, there were two, uh, two people at issue whose conduct were alleged violations. One was Lycan, the other was Lozano. Lycan had a specific duty in that case as a commissioner. Could you spell that person's name? Interest Ms. Ashmore, in, Ms. Ashmore yes. could you spell uh, for the court reporter, you said Lycan, is that what you said? I did, I'm, I'm sure that's an incorrect pronunciation, but it's Lycan, L-I-C-O-N. Okay. And that was one of the, the 
people alleged to have committed a criminal activity. And Lycan had was a commissioner who had a specific statutory duty to report his interest in a transaction um, and failed to do that. So committed malfeasance in his official duties. Now Lozano, L-O-Z-A-N-O, used her position to facilitate approval of an application for additional benefits, for higher benefits. And the court found that that detrimented was detrimentally affected society as a whole because of other people who'd be turned away by that. That, that was the, the crucial holding in, in Rangel. So both Johnson and Rangel uh, require that the official be, um, that the violations, the legal violations committed by the official in the scope of their official duties and or be detrimental to society as a whole. Now here, council member Briggs was not acting in her official capacity when allegedly violating the law. Plaintiffs claim that the alleged violation was that the, the documents she gave to the Denton Record Chronicle contained confidential information. The alleged violation providing documents to the media was done in her individual capacity, not as a duty of city council. It, it is essentially speech. She's providing words to the media and her action did not use her position for personal gain and, and it did not detrimentally affect society as a whole. The only detriment, if any, would, would have been to the word Silla and Burns McConnell, two, two private companies. Also, Ms. Council Member Briggs did not violate a specific statutory duty uh, like Mr. Lincoln in city of in El Paso versus Wrangell. Statements, it's important to note here that statements of council members like Ms. Briggs providing documents to the media, statements of council per persons are not binding on a city. Uh, and our, and we, the case that we refer to in our brief on that is Alamo carriage. Um, and Ms. Council Member Briggs was not discharging a duty that is generally assigned to her as a council person when she was providing those documents. Let, let, let me ask you this, Ms. Ashmore. Ms. Ashmore. Uh, yes. Are, aren't these the same arguments that were raised in the motion for summary judgment before trial? Yes, Your Honor, there are. And in this, now having had the benefit of seeing what evidence plaintiffs put forward at trial, um, judgment on this is even more appropriate now because not only is there any evidence that Ms. Councilmember Briggs was acting in her official capacity, you also have the benefit of additional evidence put on by defendants that the city distanced itself from her and from those actions. The city's attorney informed her that the rogue personal action was in conflict with the city's interest. We've got defendants exhibit 20 on that and plaintiffs exhibit 43. But wasn't that, wasn't, that wasn't done though until after the, the disclosure was made, right? He didn't advise her beforehand she couldn't do this. He only, he only advised her afterward that she, could, she wasn't supposed to. Isn't that correct? That is correct. But a city can only act by and through its governing body. It cannot act through individuals taking rogue actions. Uh, where the, the jury's verdict is seeking to hold the city responsible for the speech of an individual council member, which was not condoned it's, by- It's not city. really the Your speech though, is it Ms. Ashmore? It's, it's the disclosure and then the retaliation that occurred afterwards. I don't believe the jury, and there weren't any jury questions on uh, the council member's speech, Ms. Briggs' speech, it was about her disclosure and then subsequent retaliation after she got control of the council. Isn't that really what the verdict was? Well, the verdict uh, was as to um, the Whistleblower Act as a whole, but an essential element of the plaintiff's case is that the alleged violation must have been by the city, that's un under the statute. The statute states that, that a state or local government and ent governmental entity may not suspend or terminate the employment of a public employee who in good faith reports a violation of law by the employing governmental entity or another public employee to an appropriate law enforcement authority. So necessarily the jury would have had to find that the alleged violation of law was by the city of Denton 
through Ms. Briggs' actions, and there's just no evidence to support that, and it's contrary to the case law to make that finding. Okay. The other, the, the the second point that we wanted to elaborate further on for uh, and, and draw the court's attention to uh, this morning was that uh, there's not factually or legally sufficient evidence that plaintiff's report was a but for cause of uh, the termination of plaintiff's employment. Uh, plaintiffs need to have, to, in order to prevail um, and for the jury's verdict to be upheld, plaintiffs must have demonstrated that their respective terminations would not have occurred, but for, had they not reported a violation of law. Uh, plaintiffs, I think, freely admit that they rely solely on circumstantial evidence for causation. Uh, and both parties look to a case called City of Fort Worth versus Zimlick. That's Z-I-M-L-I-C-H. It's a Texas Supreme Court from uh, case from 2000, which lists five different types of cir circumstantial evidence which could be considered in cases like this. And I'll go over each of those in turn because plaintiffs don't have sufficient evidence of even one of those five uh, types of circumstantial evidence in order to support the jury's verdict here. Uh, first, knowledge of the report of illegal conduct. It was, there was uncontroverted evidence that the report of, that Ms. Briggs, council member Briggs did not know that plaintiffs had made this, this alleged report. The evidence was that city attorney Burgess knew about the report and that she had retired many months before the decision to terminate the plaintiff. She had retired in January uh, and they weren't terminated until July. Uh, the evidence showed that the only decision makers uh, on, on plaintiff's termination were Mr. Heilman and Mr. Langley. And there's no evidence that either of them knew that plaintiffs had made this alleged report in September of the year prior. Plaintiffs surmised that Langley knew, uh, but this is an inference which is based on plaintiffs' subjective belief that Howard Martin knew and that Howard Martin- Ms. Ashmore, I, I apologize. There seems to be something wrong with Zoom. It's my understanding that I had an unlimited plan, but according to, and I've had other situations where I've been able to uh, to go longer than 40 minutes, but according to the countdown, I only have nine minutes left, so we may lose this. Uh, let me hear from, I've heard these arguments all before. Let me just hear briefly from Mr. Roberson uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I apologize. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. So in regards to uh, the first argument, um, uh, it's very interesting to me that they cite Defendant's Exhibit 20, which is a letter that says, uh, we're in conflict with you because what you did could find the city liable under tort law for violating your duties. And now they're saying, but we're not responsible for your violation. Now let's frame this Texas Whistleblower Act uh, appropriately. You look at the conduct prior to the crime because Texas Whistleblower Act always by its definition includes the crime. So uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for the duties um, and uh, that they're authorized. She's a city council person. Her duty is to vote. Prior to voting, her duty is to uh, get out the information that she needs in order to influence the vote. She is authorized to talk to the media. Now the question is, now that she's authorized, I mean, there's no prohibition on it. That's what city council people do. There's every city that I'm aware of has a press office. Uh, we submitted an exhibit uh, to the court uh, dealing with the Denton uh, Electric Center that came from the press office. That was a press release. Talking to the media is an important part of what city council people do. She was doing it to influence a vote uh, and she's authorized to talk to the media. Now, when she talked to the media, she did it illegally. Just like in Lincoln, uh, in uh, the Rangel case, when he uh, filled out the report, he did it illegally by not including every information that was required, but he was filling out the report uh, in Lozano. Same thing with her application. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the important question, and we fully briefed it in, in great detail and we cut it and pasted it. The question is, were these actions purely personal uh, or were they uh, related to society good, public good? 
uh, were they related to her work? And the answer is she was trying to stop a city council vote on a $265 million project. And if that's not an argument in the public interest, I don't know what is. Uh, and as Ms. Ashmore said uh, accurately, uh, the city can only act through its uh, agents. And just as it would be uh, liable in tort uh, uh, if these two contractors had sued because she was acting as the city's agent when she released it, uh, the same for the Texas Whistleblower Act. Now, in regards for the but-for causation, the second argument, I mean, the fact that they don't like the evidence doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, in their uh, brief, uh, in 27 pages, uh, they were used the word conclusively uh, approximately 25 times, and I couldn't uh, count the times that I just wondered, do they know what the word conclusively means? There's multiple evidence on both sides. Um, she just said that there's not even evidence on one of the five elements. Now, we both agree that the city of Fort Worth versus Bimlet case uh, mentions five elements. Now, we don't have to prove each one. They're just potential ways. Now, on four of those, we have detailed, sufficient and detailed evidence as to how we connect the dots. Uh, now, for example, they spent a lot of time talking about, oh, city attorney Burgess didn't know. Well, she wasn't there at the decision maker. We don't need to show that she knew or she was, ups uh, uh, excuse me, was upset. Um, it talked about uh, Briggs knowing. Well, Briggs didn't testify that she didn't even understand or know what was happening politically on the own city council election. Uh, the jury obviously disregarded both um, Briggs um, and Langley's testimony because Whenever uh, the plaintiffs asked a question, they conveniently had no memory. Whenever the defendants asked the question, they remembered everything. Um, so uh, they have the burden of proof uh, on the affirmative defense. Um, we have the burden of proof on but for causation, but we're allowed to make it through circumstantial evidence. Uh, and we've outlined great circumstantial evidence. We only have four minutes and 37 seconds left so if your honor wishes me to go into more depth on this. Let me just say this, because I think this is kind of the fundamental issue that I see in this case and what I've seen throughout this, which is to me, uh, before we went to trial, there was a real issue about whether or not the actions, uh, the disclosure led to the, dis the reporting of Ms. Briggs' disclosure led to the termination because there was quite a bit of time between the two things occurring. Uh, I really felt like there was a fact issue there that whether or not that, that disclosure was what led to the termination. The jury heard extensive evidence on that point uh, and they made the, the determination. As the judge, it's not my job to make those types of factual determinations, on, especially on causation. And so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and deny the JNOV. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grant uh, the motion for judgment. So uh, when, uh, I guess the real question I have, and we're about to lose this uh, recording is, uh, I can try to sign, sign that now, uh, or I can wait to give you guys more time to mediate. What? because the appellate deadlines are going to start to run. What What is y'all's preference? Your Honor, from the ahead, defense Adler. perspective, I'm sorry, Mr. Roberson. Um, I was just going to say the, the fundamental issue with regard to entry of judgment is going to be the application of the statutory caps found in Texas Government Code Section 554.003C. The parties do have a uh, difference of law about uh, if and how those caps should uh, be applied. So even once we get to the denial of the JNOV, which I understand the court has just entered uh, into the entry of judgment, there is still a legal dispute between the parties about how the caps in 554.003 um, should apply. I think from a mediation perspective, um, we're, we're going to have the, um, the twin issues of the, um, the something like the JNOV argument um, going up uh, on appeal together with the application of, of the caps. So I do think that there is a, uh, a number of live 
issues, legal issues with regard to what this judgment will ultimately look like. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful Mr. Roberson agrees with me on that. Uh, well, Your Honor, I, I will say I think the, the issues are totally uh, briefed on paper. Uh, the one item I would say is if you sign the, the judgment today, uh, I think it might trigger a, a timeline that uh, is different than the 45 day timeline we need to preserve the constitutional arguments. So if the court wishes to, uh, to forward the document to the Attorney General's office today, that'll start our 45 day timeline. Uh, and then if the court uh, wishes the parties to have uh, Okay, you're cutting out. Mr. Mr. Roberson, I apologize, you're cutting out. I can't hear anything. All right, can you hear me now, Your Honor? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, the only question is, does the court wish uh, to preserve constitutional arguments? Uh, if so, then we need to wait uh, 45 days for the uh, Attorney General to... Um, the Attorney General, uh, we would agree uh, to uh, wait and even uh, uh, if the court wishes mediation in that time frame, I'd have to talk to Mr. and, and obviously Mr. Crowderville, uh, but uh, uh, that is a, certainly a possibility. I would agree uh, with my friend Mr. Roberson that if the court is going to entertain their arguments against the constitutionality of the, the caps, um, that the AG uh, is entitled to weigh in on that and that really the court has a, a choice, which is to wait 45 days to uh, uh, sign a judgment or in the alternative to deny their challenge to the 